Welcome to the Understanding Software Projects Lecture Series. My name is Steve McConnell. You may know me as the author of uh, Code Complete, or possibly the author of Rapid Development, or maybe even as the author of Software Estimation, Demystifying the Black Art. Uh, I've spent a lot of time writing books over the course of my career, and I'm proud of these books, but uh, the problem with books is once you write them, they stay exactly the same as you wrote them, even as the years go by. And as we look at the books I've written, Software Estimation was published back in 2006, Code Complete was published in uh, 2004, Software Project Survival Guide was all the way back in 1997, and Rapid Development was all the way back in 1996. Uh, these books, uh, I'm still proud of them, they're good books, uh, but I think sometimes people in the software world will look at a book that was published not just in the last decade, uh, but in the last millennium, uh, as though it were some kind of illuminated manuscript. And so this lecture series is really my attempt to update uh, and extend some of the concepts in those books and actually go way beyond those concepts as well. Uh, I have not stood still since uh, those books were published. I founded Construct Software in 2006, and over the years we've worked with every conceivable type of company. We've worked with web retailers, software as a service companies, uh, games creators, telecom, scientific instruments, uh, healthcare companies, oil and gas, pharmaceuticals, computer manufacturers, medical devices, retail companies, and the list goes on and on. Uh, we've also worked with every conceivable type of software project. We've helped companies with Scrum implementations, Kanban implementations, uh, stage gate processes, even the occasional waterfall project. So we've had the occasion to learn a lot of lessons about a lot of different kinds of software. Uh, this lecture series includes those lessons uh, that we've gained from working with hundreds of companies across a wide spectrum of industries and types of software, uh, and so this is my attempt to share that, uh, those learnings with, uh, with you. So why do we need a lecture series? Well, I think what we see is that even in modern days, even today, many software projects continue to struggle. Uh, we see that understanding of why these projects struggle is not widespread, even among experienced software professionals. And the result of that is that we continue to see reports like this. The Standish Group uh, Chaos Report shows that most projects actually are challenged or fail. A minority of projects succeed. Uh, this report from the IEEE Software Magazine uh, on perceived cancellation rates uh, shows that uh, somewhere the most common uh, perceived cancellation rate is 11 to 20 percent. Second most common is 21 to 30 percent third most common is 31 to 40 percent, and collectively what we see is basically a confirmation of the Standish Group Chaos Report that something on the order of about a quarter of all projects actually fail to the point that they are canceled. Uh, and this is kind of a big deal. We also see reports like this one from version 1 that talk about project resolutions of Agile projects, and at first glance this doesn't look too bad. The top line that says none of our Agile projects failed is the biggest bar on the graph. But if you really take a harder look at that, it's actually pretty grim. Only 15% of the respondents said that none of our Agile projects failed. And if you think about that, 15% saying that none of our projects failed means that 85% had Agile projects that did fail. And that really is not as good an outcome or as good a track record as we would really like to see. If you know what to look for, to the trained eye, the causes of these project uh, challenges and failures are usually quite apparent, but they're often misdiagnosed even by skilled, experienced software professionals. Uh, these misdiagnoses lead to all kinds of problems, and I think that what we see that is in search of progress, in search of trying to avoid uh, these failures, which are misdiagnosed, software professionals continue to chase practices that don't really work. That is, they chase fads or silver bullets, the latest and greatest uh, new technology, uh, which might seem promising, but really, which if we have some experience and know how to uh, look at and evaluate these practices, we really shouldn't be uh, going down uh, these garden paths that tend not to work out very well. We also see that this whole dynamic, if in the small we see individual software practitioners uh, chasing silver bullets, but at the industry level, this whole dynamic of challenge projects, misdiagnosed causes, and continuing to chase one silver bullet after another undermines not just individual projects, it actually undermines progress in our industry overall. And so the purpose of this lecture series is really to help you as a software professional, better understand your own software projects. Uh, and this will help you make better plans. Uh, when your plans don't work quite as you expected them to, it will help you take better, more effective corrective action. Uh, over the long haul, it will help you to make improvements in your practices faster, meaning better quality, uh, more predictability, uh, quicker delivery times, and so on. 
and it will help you respond to new developments in the software field uh, better, more safely, and more effectively. The foundation of this lecture series is what I call the Four Factors Lifecycle Model, and we'll get into that in detail next. So let's take a look at that uh, Four Factors Lifecycle Model in just a little bit of detail. Uh, as the name might imply, there are four factors in the Four Factors Lifecycle Model, and those factors are size, which is how big is the thing that you're building, uh, human variation, uh, which is not just human capability or the fact that there are humans on the project, but refers specifically to variations in the abilities of the humans on the project. Uh, uncertainty, which refers to all the things that we don't know or all the things that surprise us over the course of a project. Uh, and finally, defects, a uh, really big influence on software projects. Each of these four factors has significant influence individually, but each of these four factors also interacts with each of the other four factors in every possible combination. And understanding the individual factors and understanding the interactions goes a long way toward understanding basically everything you need to know about software projects. Uh, to tie this all together, we also add the life cycle model. And we'll get into lots of detail about that, but that essentially just explains how these factors play out over the various activities over the course of a software project. So at first glance, this diagram seems kind of simple. We've got four bubbles and we've got a life cycle uh, diagram in the middle, but it really isn't as simple as it appears. Uh, I think if you look at it superficially and just look at the four bubbles and say, yeah, I kind of understand what is in each of those four bubbles, that's going to be a pretty minimal uh, takeaway from this lecture series. But what we find is that if you closely examine each area, each of these areas goes very deep. And if we have a really deep understanding of each of the areas and of the interactions, then we can get great value in terms of improving our software project outcomes, making our lives as uh, software developers more successful, uh, and actually a little bit easier. I would say further that the dynamics that are contained in these four factors are uni universal. I will promise you that these dynamics will apply to your company. And I will further promise you that these dynamics will apply to your projects. These dynamics are so universal that at some point during this lecture series, you will say, this guy has been sitting in my conference room listening to my discussions about my projects. He must be talking about my projects. And the fact of the matter is, it's really unlikely that I've been sitting in your conference room listening to you, but that is a sign that the dynamics are truly universal and do apply to uh, the vast majority of projects out there. Furthermore, I can promise you that at some point over the course of this lecture series, the light bulb will go off and you'll say, well, that's why my last project didn't go so well. Now I understand what I would have done differently. Uh, and that's going to be an outcome of this lecture series as well. So what's coming up in this lecture series? Well, we're going to see lots of graphs. Uh, we're going to see lots of stories. Uh, and we're going to see lots of application of each of the four factors. Uh, we'll also see lots of application of the life cycle model to unpack the stories and to put the four factors in context. Uh, graphs, I tend to uh, think visually and so I like using graphs to explain concepts. Tables I also like. Uh, we're going to see lots and lots of graphs that explain all the ins and outs of each of the four factors of size, uncertainty, human variation, and defects. We're also going to hear lots of stories, or I'm going to tell you lots of stories. And we'll tell stories in each of the categories. In the size category, we'll talk about the company that succeeded on small projects but struggled with its projects as it grew. Uh, we'll talk about the company that believed projects larger than, quote, five by five were impossible. And what I mean by five by five is five people for five months. Uh, and this company was actually a really successful company, but they, their business model was premised on the idea that they would never do a project larger than five by five. Uh, we'll see the story of the large company that did okay on large projects, but actually struggled to complete small projects. Uh, in the human variation category, we'll see stories as well. In this category, we'll see uh, an explanation of how there are 10x differences or 10-fold differences in individual contributions, and that's in productivity, quality, debugging effectiveness, and really every other aspect of software development. Uh, we'll also see how that 10x difference applies to team contribution, uh, which research says that it does. Uh, we'll see a, a story of the company that shuffled team assignments uh, in the order of, uh, with the goal of improving productivity, but that actually lost velocity on every single team. Uh, we'll see the story of the team that excelled in a startup environment, but as the company grew and matured, they actually lost productivity. 
uh, we'll see the story of the company that had an outstanding Scrum pilot project that made them think that Scrum was really uh, going to be a good solution for them, but then was followed by a series of miserable follow-on projects. In the uncertainty area, we'll see stories too. Uh, we'll see the story of the team that had infinite resources yet never completed a software release. Uh, we'll see a story of a market-leading company that produced a steady stream of successes as it worked on its original product and various versions of its original product, but the first time it tried a new Greenfield project utterly failed. And we'll see the story of another market-leading company that adopted a promising new methodology, one that you have heard of, that committed to staff training that supported the staff with training and coaches and reviews and so on, but that ultimately canceled the project and took a $200 million loss. And finally, in the area of defects, uh, we will see stories here as well. We'll see the story of the project that started well, seemed to make excellent progress for most of the project, and then failed during testing. That's actually a very common dynamic. Uh, we'll see the story of the organization that spent 100% of its time correcting defects, 0% of its time actually adding functionality or moving its product forward, simply 100% of its time keeping the existing software running. Uh, and then we'll turn to the life cycle model and talk about the life cycle model building block. Uh, where we'll get a better understanding of what we mean by the activities of requirements, architecture, construction, uh, and system testing. And as I lay it out this way, you might look at that and say, uh-oh, it's looking like kind of a waterfall approach of requirements, architecture, construction, and system testing. And I promise you that's not what we're going to do. What we are going to do is talk about these activities. We're going to talk about how they depend on each other, how they flow into each other, and we'll talk about various ways of organizing these activities Occasionally, that organization might be the waterfall kind of organization, but much more commonly, we're going to talk about how we can organize these uh, iteratively in ways that actually support modern development techniques. Then we'll put it all together uh, with uh, looking at each of the four factors in the life cycle model in the middle. And uh, my promise to you is that by the time we're done with this lecture series, you will have gained a significantly enhanced understanding of your software projects and be in a significantly better position to make your project successful. Coming up, uh, we'll uh, talk about how to read the news, particularly news about software project challenges and failures. I'll give you an introduction to the life cycle model, and we'll talk about basics of software size. Thank you.